Cool, I think we're going to get started here. So thank you everyone for coming to the Kubernetes deep dive. Ah, uh, okay, got some people with that. <laughs> so this is a, a session about working with a global team and also with a global community. So we have uh, some representatives here from IBM and AT&T to talk about how it's worked with their distributed teams. So people in the audience, I'm guessing all of you work in a globally distributed team, like two time zones, three time zones, anybody four time zones? <laughs> wow, that's, it's tough for meetings, right? Yeah. So I'm Emily Hugenbrook, as you probably guessed from me being the only girl up here. Um, I'm an advisory software engineer at IBM. I work with Bob and our team stretches across the US and China. And I have a, a great panel here, so let's get started with some introductions. Thanks, Emily. Uh, my name is Matt McEwen. I'm an associate director at AT&T, and I help lead our uh, community upstream development uh, for OpenStack on behalf of uh, AT&T's integrated cloud platform. And uh, I'm Andy Ukasik. I'm a senior systems engineer at AT&T, and I, uh, I was instrumental in actually in launching the team that Matt now leads. And I work with uh, one of our working groups that we uh, initiated a little bit less than a year ago called the Large Contributing OpenStack Operators, or LCOO, which is, has a, a global, you know, globally distributed membership. And I'm also part of the product working group. And I have you know, been working with, well, on distributed teams for probably 20 years. My name is Bob Hansen. <clears throat> Uh, I, I, as Emily had said, I work for IBM, and I've worked on a, a variety of systems management related products over, you know, IBM offerings over the last 20-ish years. And I have to say, out of that 20 years, I can't remember a team that I either led or worked with that wasn't distributed, right? They've been all over the planet. Um, you know, as, as Emily mentioned, we, uh, the current team, um, we have members in OpenStack, but we've had, you know, members in Europe. Brazil, you know, just rattle off your favorite countries wherever any kind of technology development is doing now. And we've had people that have bumped into that. Uh, most recently, um, I'm working on the OpenStack stuff. Uh, I primarily do the continuous integration work for the, the ZVM operating system, so. Cool, so let's get started with some questions. I think the, the first question is, how do you build that team camaraderie with a, a globally distributed team? You know, what do you do for, for team building exercises like trust falls are a little bit difficult across continents. So, um, Andy, you want to start? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's not always globally distributed, too. Um, when, you, when you ask that question, I think of our, our well, our community team that Matt, Matt spoke of. When, when that was first uh, launched, that had a lot of young team members. And they were, you know, distributed all around the United States. I think it's significant too, you know, whether your distributed team is one where, you know, you have, you know, one or two people here, another one or two people there, uh, or if it's sort of more in, in clumps, you know, where you have a large number of them in one place, maybe another clump in another place. And, and in our case, it was more like the latter. Um, <clears throat> yeah. But so we did, you know, we had to do a lot, we did a lot of deliberate things. Um, and you know, this was a young team. You know, we had like, team building exercises and you know different things, icebreaker kinds of things, and in, in our meetings and so forth to try to you know build camaraderies. You say, like uh, you know, like asking somebody uh, to you know what kind of shoes they're wearing and what does that say about them, <laughs> and things of that nature. Yeah. Bob or Matt, you want to chime in? A really hard problem, right? Um, I know most of the projects I've worked on, at least if, when, the, when the people are actually within the United States or travel was actually easy, like from Europe, right? Um, we really did try to organize somewhere to meet, right? Not, not too unlike what's going on here, right? These happen every six months, and most recently there was a PTG. So we would find you know, some you know, design thing or something to rally around, right? So that we could at least have lunch together you know, and have some conversation that, that, that we can do. And we would then try to shore that up with, with the basic tools that we're all familiar with, you know. We've done IRC, which is, 
effective with some groups and not so effective with other instant messaging kinds of things. We've even tried to do video chats, you know. Just anything to just try to make eye contact, right, is, is really big um, to get people to kind of, you know, essentially uh, call less a little bit and so that we can work on some of those harder problems together. Yeah, and that that uh, face to face is huge when you can get it, and uh, that's why you know Andy and I work together every day, and uh, and it's great to actually see him face to face. Uh, but the same thing holds true, you know, on a day to day basis with engineers, right? And being able to pick up the phone is really valuable too. Teleconferencing, of course, uh, with video, um, because you know IRC is the lingua franca for communication in OpenStack, right? Uh, but any kind of if you're relying solely on text-based communication, it just opens up a real opportunity for miscommunication. And uh, if, and you have to keep an eye out for that, right? You almost want to, uh, within a team, have uh, intentional, periodic, uh, verbal, or video sync-ups just to avoid falling into that trap. Yes. Just following up on what you said, Matt, uh, it makes me think, because you, you, know, you mentioned IRC, for example. And when I, I first started, you know, I first uh, you know, wanted to get involved with the product working group, you know, I started to go out attending their IRC meetings and so forth. And, you know, and frankly, yeah, I, uh, I, was, I was trying, but I was no participant. Yeah, it was very difficult to follow you know, what really was going on, why, you know, where, what the focus was and so on. It wasn't until I went to the product, to their their meetup, their mid-cycle meetup, where we you know met in person all day for you know, for two days, uh, that everything clicked together. And then af after that, subsequent to that, the IRC meetings are very effective, you know. But it's because we all already know, um, you know, it's like the conversations already happened, and now we're just putting down notes, you know, and providing status, you know. But you know, knowing there are things that we still, you know, that really call for more discussion, then there are you know side meetings where we'll use phone bridges and you know we'll work that way. Yeah. Yeah. So um, next topic meetings. You know, other than IRC and and phone, you know, it, what works best for meetings, and is it good to have a, a mix of of ways for people to communicate in a meeting? So, Bob, do you want to start with that one? So. I've had actually had really good results, right, with, with some kind of a meeting at some frequency where people try to get um, on the phone and talk to each other. Now, obviously, with a team that's partially in Beijing, that's extremely difficult, right? Um, so, so I, I guess to say what Emily had done was actually we kind of split the pain, right? So, like one week, you know, the meeting will be at nine o'clock in the morning, you know, Eastern time, you know, depending on what standard time is or not, and then the following week we would we would pick a time that was a little easier for the team that's actually in Beijing. Um, that's a good second best to have those annual meet, uh, those, those, those meetings at a, at a certain frequency because you get to talk to each other. Right? Now, it seems that English seems to be the language of choice for most, most people, right? Obviously, you know, in a country like China, the English sales might not be, you know, as good as you might like, but we seem to find ways to struggle through that and, and we're able to, you know, just have a, a conversation, right? Because I'll have to say, you know, the IRCs and the chats and the instance messaging, the written word is, is definitely, and I'll second your point, is often up to interpretation where just the simple inflection of your voice um, actually communicates more than you probably realize. So we've had pretty good luck with that. You know, we try to do it once a week, sometimes it's every other week, but at least get, get you know, have that communication happen on a regular basis. One thing I'd add too, um, not to disparage IRC or text-based communication too much, because it is incredibly valuable. One thing, you know, like Bob and Andy were saying, right? We come from companies that have been doing uh, global telecommun uh, teleworking uh, for our entire careers. So, globally distributed teams is nothing new. It's always been a part of the way that we all do our jobs. But the the interesting thing for me coming into OpenStack and coming into community development is that you're entering a culture where that's the only way of doing uh, teaming. And as such, uh, from the ground up, everything is organized around uh, distributed teams. And so when your team adopts OpenStack norms and OpenStack conventions you know, the, uh, that have been laid out as um, you know, guidelines for project teams, 
uh, it actually can uh, alleviate some of the challenges that, uh, you know, within AT&T or otherwise uh, that you have with globally distributed teams. Um, so IRC, for example, right? Maybe it's not the only solution for meetings, but it does a great job of, of handling the challenge of uh, folks in all different time zones working at all different hours really well. Right. Yeah, so has anything not worked well on your teams? Any? Uh, <laughs> Any horror stories or uh, that, that time you <laughs> typed that thing in and somebody took it completely the wrong way? Horror stuff. I don't have a horror story. I, I mean, it's just, just something that probably would be pretty obvious. But in, uh, in LCOO, we have you know, members from all around the world. Yeah, and, and so, and as a working group, you know, for us, it's, it's really not effective to try to have uh, our meetings with IRC. We've tried that sort of thing. You know, it really calls for being able to have discussions. We're a working group, we're, you know. And so <laughs> scheduling those, though, is, is just difficult because no matter what time you pick, it's going to be very inconvenient for somebody. You know, and so we, the best we're really able to do there is, is to just rotate the burden <laughs> so that, you know, it's, it's in, not always inconvenient for the same people. Um, but it, it, it is a problem because inevitably, you know, you have a meeting and then some of the people won't be able to attend because it's four in the morning where they are, you know. Bob or Matt, you want to weigh in on? I, the, the, only, the only horror story I would say is uh, just in general what we mentioned before, miscommunication, miscommunication, miscommunication. Uh, it is... It's, it's the, in my experience, the biggest danger with a distributed team is just getting people off sync uh, from either a technical standpoint or a, uh, you know, communicative, uh, you know, interpersonal standpoint. And a lot of problems uh, just go away as soon as you get these folks actually, like, you know, syncing up, um, you know, verbally uh, or on the phone, something like that. Uh, so that, that's something that I'm sort of hyper aware of now um, as a lesson learned and that we're, we're actively uh, working around. I guess I can give one story of, of a combination of tools that didn't work out real well. And I, and I say this tongue in cheek, right, because this is, I really am joking. I was working with a team that um, we used to have our, our, our weekly meetings and there was one indiv individual that we did have difficulty understanding. I mean, you know, it's just, it just, just the communication was, wasn't kind of there. So, so what I had done was I used the combination of the tools, right? So we were on the, we're on the phone, and then what I asked him is, uh, do me a favor, you know, can you also type it into our instant message client that we were using at the time? And he did that. He was very patient, but when that phone call en ended, I got a phone call from him, and basically I got called out because I couldn't understand his English and all that, and it was just a, a very negative, different thing. So the reason I bring that up is you need to be very careful, right, on, on how you communicate things like language barriers and, 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 and that sort of stuff, because you can make mistakes like that where you actually you find yourself offending somebody, and, and that's really not what we're after. Right? You know, when we started AT&T's team of community contributors, it was... It, it, this was a situation where, you know, they were clumped, and the majority of the people were, well, were located in St. Louis, and then there were smaller numbers that were in some other, you know, outlying regions. And, and um, what happened was, is the people who were in these other outlying regions, you know, started feeling really marginalized, and and were, you know, being and voice, you know, and spoke to me, told me about, you know. Um, how frankly very unhappy they were, how because they, they felt you know just like they were out outside of the loop, you know they weren't, and and so we you know we had meetings as a team to address that, and and you know we made a number of decisions to be very deliberate in how we changed the way we communicated so that it would be more inclusive of everyone. Um, for example, you know. Because, of course, when you're all together in one location, your tendency is going to be, you know, you're going to want to just meet face-to-face, -face, have your discussions face-to-face. -face. It's quick. It's easy. But then you've left out your other team members. And so, you know, we made a point of we started setting up chat rooms so we could make, be, make use of that. That was very effective. They were, everyone was in that all the time. That really helped a lot. Um, you know, but we also, and we also established team meetings where we used, um, you know, video conferencing, and so everybody, you know, was present, and, 
we used a, we were able to create an environment where you know everyone could see everyone, and, and all of these things really began to work together to change the culture um, and change the way people communicated, which is is actually it actually just brought things m to be more in line with the way it is in the OpenStack community, you know, where everybody's so distributed. So you just begin to adopt those practices. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll add a, a story about not using any colloquialisms or uh, you know local language. At one point, we were having problems with a, a lot of new team members always stomping on our test systems and and bringing everyone down. And so we were adopting a team motto of, of "Don't be a bull in a china shop." Uh, so. It's a, a U.S. phrase for you know not stomping around and and ruining everything for everyone else. Um, and and one member of the team came up to us and said, you know that's really offensive. I'm not Chinese. I'm Korean. And we said, oh wow, we we totally did not realize that that would read as as offensive. It's just a, a saying here in in the U.S. And and she had never heard it before. Um, and so, yeah, we learned after that to be a lot more careful about uh, using those colloquialisms. But let's talk now about the OpenStack community. So what do you think the OpenStack community can be doing differently to make it you know, easier for the, the team around the world to, to contribute and, and get more involved? I, I can add uh, one thing. I mean, first, uh, the OpenStack community has been incredibly welcoming as a rule. And so I, I think that it's a, a really outstanding place uh, for new contributors to get involved. Um, so I, I think it's already starting out really well. The only thing I'd add is um, that, you know, there's probably a small minority of folks out there that are just innately suspicious of contributions coming from large companies uh, like, like ours. Uh, and you know, don't don't err on the side of being suspicious. Everyone who works for large companies and comes in and is uh, uh, contributing is uh, at least at least from our team is coming in with really good faith, trying to make a um, a great difference in the community uh, with the best of intentions and a lot of good work. So you know, just give people the benefit of the doubt. Andy or Bob, any any thoughts on how you'd like to see the community work differently? I'll, 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 let me, yeah, let me say that one of the area that, you know, the area where I'm focused in now is something that, that the community has really been trying to nurture, um, in particularly over the past couple of years, and, which is, is to be, to really, to try to inject uh, to a much greater extent the needs of the users, the needs of the operators, the users of OpenStack into the OpenStack roadmap, into what really drives, you know, the direction of the development evolution of the platform. And so, you know, to that end, there's been a number of steps that they've taken. You know, one of them you'll, you'll experience, you know, here this weekend for the first time, which is the forum. Um, and, um, and so, you know, this is one of the things I guess I would say that, you know, we're, we're really trying to do better is to try, try to open up uh, the voice of the user. And there are a lot of barriers to that, practical barriers that uh, people in the community don't really tend to think about. And once you're, once you're well embedded in the community, you become a, something of a community insider. You've got your nose in the mail lists and all the different things that are going on. And you're, you're aware of all sorts of things, but other people simply will not be. And the tools that the community uses can be pretty um, obscure to many people out in the typical business world. And, and so trying to tell somebody that you need to contribute um, your ideas about requirements and so forth in, uh, in a text file in Garrett is, is a bit of a barrier. It's, if it's going to take them you know, more than 30 minutes or more than an hour to be able to to just even set up, you know, an environment to be able to do it, um, you know, they're going to disengage. And so these are some of the things we need to address. Yeah, yeah I, I've definitely noticed that with um, women of OpenStack and the way that their meetings tend to be run versus um, like the Tempest group meetings. You know, Tempest is is really good about having, um, you know, the agenda set ahead of time and, um, you know, we all come into to IRC and, and have a lively discussion. Um, and Women of OpenStack tends to do more phone calls um, and, and do things that way. Um, 
more. So yeah, definitely, I, I can see the, the difference between the more developer technical focused versus the, the working groups and, and, and people who are maybe not that uh, techie background necessarily. Or even that they're very technical, but they're just not, you know, they're working in the normal business world. They're not working in the OpenStack community world, which is its own culture. So I think now we're going to open it up for some audience questions. Um, and in the theme of uh, trying to be more inclusive and uh, use different ways of communicating, we've set up an etherpad that you guys can go out to. Uh, so it's there, or I'll bring it up on the screen here. If anybody wants to uh, type in questions on the etherpad, That's one of the things you'll experience in the forum sessions too this weekend is that everyone has, every session will have an ether pad and those are meant to be discussion oriented. And, you know, the conversation really flows from what's happening in the ether pad. Can I just talk at the microphone instead? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so one of the questions I've got, um, we work, I work for a Dutch company based out of Netherlands, but we're in, I don't know, 12 time zones or something. So we have a very distributed team, uh, and we've tried to implement things like follow the sun, and when you're off hours on one region, you're supporting another one, you know, and trying to use the environment and your infrastructure the most efficiently. With OpenStack, are you seeing uh, a better model for large groups collaborating globally and running the same infrastructure and supporting each other, or has it not gotten to that level of maturity yet? So I, I can speak to part of that. I don't think it answers your entirety of the question, but um, one thing that I, I've seen work really well and work really poorly is that whole follow the sun model, right? Uh, and I think this is one of those areas where doing things in sort of the community-focused way works much better. Uh, there have been times that I've worked with distributed teams where the developers on one in one time zone are not really involved hands-on, uh, person to person, developer to developer with the team members in another time zone. Uh, there are various kinds of proxies in between them, right, to sort of mitigate cultural differences or um, organizational barriers or things like that, right? Um, so it's a little bit more of a throw it over the wall um, just from the get-go because uh, the that's just the way it's set up. Um, but, uh, you know, again, OpenStack is, uh, as a community project, is geared entirely around developers talking to other developers. Uh, and that has been really key in my experience to achieving successful follow the sun kinds of, of approaches, uh, where you have um, a relationship established between a couple of guys who can uh, hand off work in a meaningful way and have it continue. Bob, do you want to weigh in on that? Um, I don't think I have much to add, I mean, to that, that particular question. I, because I think what I would give is the follow the sun pitch, right? And, and, and I'd have to agree that, that that only works if the teams actually are very, you know, knowledgeable of each other's technologies. And, and most of the cases, they're not, right? I mean, that's just the way we structure our teams, right, by, by locations. Well, in the... Um, <clears throat> In, in the product working group, actually, what they've done is uh, they've, you know, we have, we have two different meetings. There's one, you know, there's one that's, um, you know, timed for the people basically in the western half of the world, and another one that's for those in the eastern half of the world. And so, uh, you know, there's sub teams, you know, two sub teams. And why that can work is because four times a year we all come together face to face and those on it really honestly those you know those intense long-term you know sessions together they they set the tone then for all the work you know that's being done in the intervening period um, so that everyone is in sync because we all understand the objectives and what we're working on our goals and um, and then of course there are you know various you know side meetings and things that still connect people but that that actually is working you know pretty well yeah so I think we have a couple questions at the bottom of the ether pad here. I'll just scroll down. Okay. 
So I think there's one here about mentioning that you have chat rules to help remote people not feel excluded from the, the conversation. So what are some chat rules that, that you like to set up? I think we mentioned maybe like idioms, not, not using those colloquialisms is, is one of them. Well, certainly basic courtesy, you know. <laughs> And to be positive, it's always. I think it's, it's you know it's certainly important to be positive about things, or at least to try to express things in a positive light. Um, I, you know, we've uh, this isn't quite what you asked, but you know we've we've also had you know um, situations where you have a meeting you know like this, only it's, it's a discussion, um, and at the same time you're in an etherpad kind of like this. And in fact, that's how all of the ops meetups work. And, and that actually can be really effective because the people who are less vocal, you know, and so forth, they're still putting their stuff in the etherpad. Or, you know, if somebody states something in the etherpad, other people are putting little plus ones, plus ones, plus ones to show that they support that idea. And, and this stuff's all kind of happening dynamically. Or you can ask a question, um, you know, and put a few different lines in the etherpad for answers and everybody's just kind of voting. You know, and they're all, this is all happening as a subtext into the conversation. And it, it can really work very well because you know, as you're moderating, you, you can see the kind of reactions that you're getting from all you know, in the audience. Um, and it puts everybody on an equal, you know, equal level. Yeah, and I'll say it doesn't have to be Etherpad. I know that there are a lot of different technologies out there that, that let you do the sharing. Um, so we've used like Box Notes on our team, um, and some of the like Microsoft Office 365 even, even lets you do some of that stuff with uh, Word documents or PowerPoints or, or something like that. So you can really work on them collaboratively as you're talking about them. If I can add on to that, um, you know, we mentioned before how uh, you can have sort of a, a clustered kind of um, thing where you have a, a big group in one area and other groups in other areas, right? Um, and it really takes an intentional effort on the part of the folks that are co-located to, to go out of their way to make sure everyone else uh, doesn't feel like they're not part of the main group, right? It's, right. It's not, it doesn't happen automatically. And uh, you know, if you're in that, that center of gravity, you probably don't feel like everyone else is an outsider, uh, but the other folks might. So it really behooves you to go out of your way. And one way, uh, you know, pulling us back to the question that we uh, approached that recently is, you know, we had some folks in that location doing whiteboarding and uh, explaining some things uh, to the, the located team. And some other folks on the team were like, oh man, I wish that we could, uh, we yeah. could participate in that, and we did. We we just set up a webcam pointing at the whiteboard, and the guy was, uh, you know, going through the exact same conversations, and it worked out really well. Everyone in the, uh, you know, in the meeting room uh, locally, there was, you know, no fidelity lost, and for the remote folks, they got uh, quite a bit out of it as well. So that's a very simple, uh, low-tech approach to uh, introducing uh, remote whiteboarding. Cool. Have you guys used Mural at all? It's a, a whiteboarding app. Um, we've tried it a little bit. Um, mostly good for like sticky notes like Kanban boards cool. and stuff like that. Um, I see that there's a, a question about any advice for supporting cultural differences or is it best to just, just oh. avoid culture in a team? <laughs> <laughs> just, well. just pretend we're all robots, they're, right? They're, we're there to code 14 hours a day, right? There, there are yeah, there are absolutely cultural differences, you know, that that factor in. Uh, we, you know, Americans in particular, we, we tend to be pretty outspoken. We tend to be you know, pretty brash in comparison to some other cultures. Uh, and so, you know, what I'll find is, well, in a meeting, say, within LCO, um, we'll ask a question or, you know, we'll have, you know, we'll be having a conversation. And if there's, you know, one or two seconds of silence, I, I feel like I need to say something, you know, I need to keep it going. Um, but we have to just sit for about five seconds or so before many of um, like our Asian members will then speak up. They're much more, you know, they're, I, I, you might say polite <laughs> or, uh, you know, they don't just barge in with their comments. And, um, and so, you know, yeah, as you said, you, know, you have to be intentional about all those kinds of things, you know. Uh, one thing that is really important is uh, 
if the team members will go out of their way to help their remote team members, uh, that can cover up, uh, you know, a whole lot of ills, um, you know, a whole lot of misunderstandings. If you go out of your way to help your teammate, to, uh, and I mean really go out of your way and demonstrate that you're work working to, to help them, they'll cut you a whole lot of slack in the future and you've made a friend and a colleague. So uh, it's another one of those things not to take for granted. Um, it's worth going out of the way for and it helps build your team. Yeah, so any got somebody over there. With the question on the work-life balance, do you guys use anything to differentiate, I need an answer whenever you're free versus I need an answer now? Like, I work in operations, our QA team's in oh. Lviv, Ukraine, and there are times when I'm, like, when I'm finishing up my day and I want to hand off work or I need questions, but I don't care, if, I don't want them to get, get out of bed to answer my question. Right. What do you guys, do you guys use any specific f ways of differentiating what you, how much you need something? I, I think a lot of that, um, like if like operations, you know, things can be need to be fixed like now, right? Whereas whereas development questions, you know, or or some question about a technology could probably wait, right? So for the operation kind of things, this, at least we have a management structure in place that helps us with that, right? So I'm not going to call somebody in Beijing, you know, at four o'clock in the morning their time because I have a question about their API. Right? But if I am supporting a system that breaks down that affects our customers, then we need to run the management chain to solve that. So, so you know, in some ways it's back to the cultural thing, right? Let the management team in that country handle it the way that, you know, they do there, right? And we don't tend to interject ourselves in that kind of thing. Yeah. You, I, you know, you do it, you have to have an understanding, which again means you have to actually talk about it and decide, you know. but. You know how things would escalate, like you know, because certainly, you know, and certainly the tools really are great as far as making it possible for us to, you know, to for people to be, um, you know, engaged in conversations in their own time, you know, offline by going in and contributing a comment or what have you. But then, you know, so there's you know, things that where you might be putting comments in a, you know, on a wiki page or something. But then there's also something that you might send somebody a message about in Slack. Or you know, or IRC, um, you know, the in my mind, and I've worked it out with some others. You know, if it if it's really serious, then you send a text message. You know, and what I actually what I uh, when you first asked the question, what flashed in my mind immediately was just a little system that my my girlfriend and I have, which is that you know she'll call, I'll be in a conference call or something, so I won't pick it up. Um, but the, the deal is, if she calls right back again, then that means it's something really important. And I'm, I'm going to put my call aside for a moment, and I'm going to take hers. You know, and, that, and that's the understanding. Yeah, I'll say I, I know our um, China team as well uses WeChat, and obviously they don't put anything confidential on there, but um, I'll notice that, that if I have a, a question that, that needs to be answered right away and, and I ping any member of the team, then they'll put a, a ping out on WeChat, you know, oh, so-and-so, can you um, respond to, to Emily's email within the, the next couple hours? So having, having like a, a code that you can use in some outside chat if you really have to to get in touch with someone is useful too. And, and like, like Andy was saying, there's a, we, we have so many different kinds of communication tools and we've probably talked about a dozen of them that we all use up here on stage and that wasn't even getting into the ones that are internal to AT&T, which we probably have another dozen. Uh, and so they've just naturally kind of fallen into a prioritized order on the team. So depending on how urgent a question is, you just uh, use a different communication mechanism. And like Andy said, at the end of the day, if you need to get a hold of somebody faster, you just text them or call them. Yeah, so I guess we'll end with an easy question maybe. What's what's your favorite method of communication with your remote team? And Bob, if you want to say uh, Lotus same time. Uh, I don't <laughs> I think that's probably our least favorite one around, around the lab. That's the one that seems <laughs> That's the one that seems to work the best though. <laughs> and it's the one that we like the least. So um, 
Um, but th that one that we're mentioning, it isn't persistent. So if the person isn't actually, you know, logged in, you know, they lose the message. So, so you, it, usually it's it's email, right? Um, that seems to be the the best way, right? At least for me. I'm going to go for the easy crowd pleaser here and say that my favorite way of uh, communicating with my remote teams is to meet them here at the summit. <laughs> <laughs> them drinks, oh, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I. That's actually something you know, it's, it's, that requires some thought. Because um, on the one hand, you know, we all, you know, the milieu in which I work, at least you know, a lot of, lot of developers, a lot of technical people, everybody seems to love the instant messaging tools. They, they, they just, for whatever reason, it seems that people don't want to communicate verbally. And yet, of course, verbal communication, in my experience, is the most effective form that we have. Um, you know, you can get something, you know, communicated much faster, much more effectively verbally, yet, yet we really don't do that very much. Um, and I'm, and so I often think, how, how could we improve on that? You know, how could we, you know, make it easier for people to do that? But of course, when you communicate verbally, it requires attention and it, you know, it requires immediate, you know, engagement and response. You know, Whereas you know, popping something into a, a, a chat room, um, you you could ignore that for a few minutes, you know, or what have you, and then you can respond. You could take your time to think about it, then you can respond. Email is the one that I actually hate the most. <laughs> it's it's just the bane of my life. There's just a constant flood of email, and just even you know, sorting through it to see which ones are even you know worth answering just takes a, way too much of your time. Yeah. Well, cool. I think we're uh, just about at time. So thank you, everyone, for coming and hope you have a great summit. Thank you. And we'll, we'll keep checking the Etherpad and, and responding to questions on there periodically, too. So if you think of something later. <laughs>